This is Wandering Universe. Today, I'll be looking at the smallest pyramid still standing humbly next to the two big pyramids, the Menkor Pyramid. So, let's go exploring. Here we are. This is the aerial view of the Menkor Pyramid, as you can see here. There's a nice little gateway there, a nice little canal, probably water, water channel that leads to the interior of the pyramid. And these are the smaller master bus pyramids next to it. But I'll go into further detail later. Next photo, as you can see, and there's that long gash that has been talked about in the past. And he, that was a side view, and here's a front view of the entrance to the pyramid. Not this entrance, the bottom entrance here. So, this, as you know, is Menkor Pyramid. It was named after King Menkor. It's the third smallest pyramid, and it's situated in the Giza Plateau near Cairo, Egypt. It was supposedly served as a tomb, question mark, for the fourth dynasty Egyptian king. He reigned for 22 years, so assuming he was crowned at age 15, he retired around mid to late 30s. Now, the pyramid, the height is about 65.5 metres or 215 feet. The base is 108.5 metres or 356 feet and it's angled at 51.2 degrees. Now I'll just illustrate this here for you. This is a digital diagram of the pyramid itself, including its neighbouring smaller pyramids here. What's interesting about this particular diagram is that it's showing the subterranean chambers situated underneath this pyramid and also underneath this pyramid as well. I'd say that there are further chambers that lead to the other pyramids next door to it. So that would be a fascinating find. This pyramid is mostly made of limestone and granite quarried from the Ashwan, Ashwan quarry, should I say. And this is it, as you can see here. What I find fascinating about this particular wall is that look how accurately cut so precisely. I mean, it's just incredible the tools they used back then. So advanced. And you can see that there are square holes imprinted along the top edge of this wall here. I find that interesting that whatever was placed there must have been some sort of steel beam that had just corroded over the thousands of years. But whatever machine they used is just pretty incredible how smooth the surface is. So very well done there. The exterior is made of red granite. I'm going to show you here. This is what I'm talking about, the bottom base of the pyramid. And the upper portion is cased with Tura limestone. So as you can see, that's most of it at the top here. I'll show you another photo. The cuts are pretty well precise, as you can see. Flat, smooth, and up here, maybe rough around the edges, not very precisely placed, but it, it is for a good reason. But I just find this pattern, especially here, these um, bolt heads, I would call them. I'm not sure what it's used for, but it would have been used for something else, maybe to lever and hoist this particular block may be used as a starting point in order to slot in these other granite blocks next to it. So interesting, interesting analogy there. So there's a big difference between the smooth surface of this wall and the upper portion of it. Remember the wall, I think it's somewhere in Peru, Machu Picchu. If you look at the pattern here, it's very similar to the one over there. Interesting. Part of the granite was left in the rough. I'll show you another picture here. As you can see, that's the upper portion there. I'm not sure why it was. Something happened, maybe some sort of catastrophic event, maybe a seismic activity. 
such as an earthquake. I'm not sure why these blocks were just left as they are. So can't answer that question for you right now. And over here, I think that's the platform that leads onto the lower opening of this pyramid. I think, I'm not sure, I haven't been there yet, but I think that's like a platform and there must have been some sort of little villa or valley next to it. See what I mean here? This is what I'm talking about. So if it's rough, oh, that's interesting. Well, if it's rough and it's purposely left that way, look at these precise cuts here. And look at there, another precise cut. So certainly not man-made. It's certainly done by somebody else. But why were they left in this manner? I'm not sure. I cannot answer that question in the meantime. So let's go on. It was built and completed in the 26th century BC. The construction date is unknown due to his reign not being accurately defined. How interesting. It stands only a few hundred meters from its partner pyramids. And as you can see, this is what it's demonstrating there. And I'll show you the front entrance of the Minkor pyramid. This is what I'm talking about. This would have been a platform, a very smooth level platform that led to the bottom entrance of this pyramid. Now, I'm not sure why the there's a big mess pile of rocks here. It's very, very messy. I'm not sure why, why should I say, it's being left in that manner. Maybe um, they tried to excavate this part of the pyramid here and just threw the rocks there. I doubt it that anyone could lift these 20 ton, 50 ton stone blocks by hand and then have incredible strength and stamina to just throw it on the ground here. I find that impossible. Now this is the other side of the pyramid. This is the gateway. I showed you in an, you can see, or I showed you in an earlier diagram, that is like a gateway, possibly water channel that led to this tunnel here and I'll show you another part here this is the entrance to the lower level entrance and this is the stairway to get to the bottom chamber so let's go on here the upper antechamber it's called was discovered by Howard Weiss on 28th of July 1873 so it starts here it goes all the way down I've heard that it is really steep, so if you've got good knees and you've done some staircase exercises um, at the gym, well, you're ready for this type of adventure. And then you get to the first part of the chamber room here. This would be, you have to crouch down for this, leading to the next chamber, possibly to the one that you'll see next but as you can see there is no hieroglyphics on the wall to depict anything that happened or anything that occurred within this pyramid so let's go on when you enter the north side there is a passage that descends into bedrock to the antechamber in the west end is the king's chamber so to speak a gabled roof made of granite and i'll show you what i mean here so this leads further down from this tunnel here and you get to this main chamber now there's a little bit of graffiti on the wall there possibly by squatters possibly by visitors or what do you call them tomb raiders that were looking for treasure now over here there was something here there was something but it's missing missing i think you can guess what it is the underside of the roof has been chiseled into shape of an arc and was painted. The walls are lined with granite, as you can see here. I think it's, it looks more like rose granite. This is the opening to get to the um, roof chamber, and I'll show you what I mean here. 
This is the main entrance to get to the lower chamber. There are steps that lead down to the doorway to the tomb chamber. It contained a basalt sarcophagus with carved figures on the outside. Now I'm going to give you an illustration of what Vice witnessed. This was it. Now, nah, I don't know if it was true or not, but I'm going to get into that now. According to Graham Hancock, who analyzed the Vice's eyewitness account at the time, this is what he said. G3 predates the 4th dynasty and originally had no sarcophagus added later by the Mustabus culture. So, sarcophagi was attributed to Merasank, Ras the third wife of Khafre Coffin. He entered the main chamber of Mankor and discovered the basalt sarcophagus. The chamber contained a great quantity of rubbish and black dust. That's what he witnessed. Position of the coffin was not centered but moved against the wall. Now I'll go back to um, right here. This is what he was talking about. There was supposed to be that against the wall, but the mystery is we don't know where, where it went, we don't know where it disappeared to. But I'll get into that in a minute. It's it, it just it'll just baffle baffle your mind for a moment. It had no hieroglyphics or inscriptions of any kind and no lid found in the chamber. More rubbish found in the chamber niches. In one of the niches chamber he found fragments of the top of a mummy case inscribed with hieroglyphics, so to speak, that include the cartouche or cartridge in French of Mancor or Mencor, should I say. The lid had been fixed with two pins, a dovetail and a groove cut across the rim of the top. He thinks to insert a lever for removal, question mark. But this information is from Grant Hancock's article disputing Vice's discovery. From what I can see here, there was something there, don't get me wrong, but was it a sarcophagus? Was it, as he described it. Was it this kind of sarcophagus? Now, from what I can see, I don't think this is the sarcophagus that was there. It just looks too good to be true. Just looks a bit too elaborate for its time. Very artistic, precise in its pattern, precise in its artistic flair, but the way it's designed looks like it might have been done later on, maybe in the middle to the New Kingdom, not in the Old Kingdom. I doubt very much. To be fair, to be fair, if he said that there was rubbish scattered around this main chamber, what sort of rubbish did he see? Was it just bones, animal bones, um, people's leftovers, their gear. Were there squatters living in the pyramid during the ancient times? I mean, were they, they decided to set up camp and called this their new home? Had they nowhere to go? Is that an indication that within this chamber that the squatters housed, them, housed themselves in, there was very turbulent economic times back then? Hmm, lots of unanswered questions, may I say. So just have a think about it for a moment, this illustration here. He also found a wooden anthropod coffin, so to speak, inscribed in Minkle's name and contained human bones, question mark. And I'll show you what I mean right here. This is what I'm talking about. This is the only thing, so-called legitimate artifact, artifact, sorry, that speaks of Minkor's location, Minkor's body. That's it. That's all he found. This, in my opinion, it's not good enough. In Graham's opinion, it's still not good enough. In, anyone, in anyone's mind, it's still not good enough. But I'll go on. 
Also, there are four other burial niches, assuming for Menkor's family members. I'll show you right here. This is one side as you descend through um, the entrance here. And this is the other side here. Not sure what that stone block is doing there. Not sure what that is. Maybe it's a granite lid from a f former sarcophagus. Not sure, but I'm not sure why it's moved there. Or maybe it was placed there for a reason. That's interesting. The bones carbon dated to be less than 2,000 years old. It's disputed. Skeletal remains came from another site and just left it in there or access to pyramid during Roman times. This is very uncertain, this theory. Speculated it were tombs, that old chestnut they keep using. The structure itself once contained pink granite sarcophagus. Now, I'll show you a photo. This is just not a replica, but I'm just giving you an example. This was supposed to have been found inside the antechamber of the pyramid right here. He witnessed that there were these handles on this lid. And he said that there were patterns, but didn't say what sort. With this particular sarcophagus, there's no hieroglyphics. How interesting. And remember, this is really, really heavy. Not just to lift, but also carry it all the way up to the main entrance to bring it outside. I'll give you another example here. This one may be close to the one that Vice witnessed. Okay. Handles here. The lid. And see the pattern right here? This coffin was found in Abu Ra uh, Rawash. The previous one is the coffin of Mary Sank or Mur Sank. So he may be on the ball or maybe he missed the mark with what he saw or maybe he just made the whole thing up. Who knows? In the antechamber, he also found the lid of a coffin with human bones. The lid was inscribed with Menkor's name. It was transported to England and it's at the British Museum. Well, I'm not sure which one, if anybody can tell me where the lid has been, is displayed at which British Museum, please let me know in the comments section. Further into the pyramid, Vice found a basalt sarcophagus rich in detail with a bold projecting corpse. I think corners, which is basically a decorative doorway. It had bones of a young woman, question mark. Why would they find bones of a young woman inside this particular sarcophagus? What for? Unless she was mummified and placed in three or four different wooden coffins before they put this on top. Why would they just find bones without, mum, with the, without the mummy bandages around it? Hmm, doesn't sound right to me. This is an illustration of what I said earlier. This, he said, was apparently moved to one side of the chamber against this wall. And I showed you earlier that there was a space, some sort of space that indicated the sarcophagus was moved there. How can you move a 20, 50 tonne rose granite sarcophagus to one side of the chamber just with two people alone that's impossible i think this guy was making stuff up don't you think i think he was this is what supposedly happened next okay and it baffles me all right he moved the basalt sarcophagus out of the chamber up the stairs to the antechamber to the ascending passage to the main front entrance, entrance with great and incredible difficulty. It was transported on the 13th of October 1838 on the ship called um, Beatrice. A bad storm knocked the ship onto its side whilst it passed through the Straits of Gibraltar into the Atlantic Ocean, but it now lies at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. Hmm, coincidence? 
On her maiden voyage to Britain, it may have sunk between Malta and Carthagena. I'll show you a photo of it. I'm still skeptical how you can lift this up the um on sleds, on wooden sleds, mind you, with 50 men, 100 men with ropes pulling it all the way, those small little ent um, passages, all the way up to the main front entrance. It just, I just can't explain it, can you? This is a ship, wooden ship, that it was supposedly put on transportation to Britain, and it sunk mysteriously hmm if you want to learn more about how advice i'll put a link below for you to do your own research in the description box below the foundations and inner core of the pyramid are made of limestone the floors made of granite and granite facings were added to some of the walls some blocks weighed more than 220 tons granite ashlars from the ashwan quarry weighed more than 30 tons I'll show you what i mean here this is what i'm talking about i find it impossible you can move that huge sarcophagus through this passage impossible explain why he had great difficulty getting it out of the pyramid in the first place but this is what i'm talking about here these granite stone blocks how they're placed Quite neatly and quite precisely on top of one another there so pretty well done for its time but of course there's going to be wear and tear through age over the centuries I'll show you another example here now this is the interior of the period of Menkor that's the en entrance passage here descending passage to the so-called burial chamber okay I'm just putting these quote marks here because I really don't buy that it was actually a burial chamber. I think it was far more than that. Now I'm going to illustrate the similar similarities, but also differences from the two other pyramids, um, the interior of it. Now, as you can see, that's the Menkor one, that's the Khafre, and that is the Khufu pyramid. Notice the difference in the positions of the interior chambers here. And I believe that there are more subterranean passages underneath this pyramid this one and this one and they go further out to the smaller pyramids to the sphinx and also to other pyramids to lead down to the river nile possibly the river nile was a giant lake many thousands of years ago otherwise they wouldn't have built these subterranean passages and these midsection chambers in the first place but don't get me wrong you could say that they were tombs, but you could also say that they were something else other than just a burial chamber. You could say that they were used for something far highly advanced than just the conventional wisdom theory that we've all, yes, been granted to drum them out heads over and over and over again. The Menkor Valley Pyramid was excavated between 1908 and 1910 by American archaeologist George Andrew Reisner. He found a large number of statues of Menkor and some others related to him, carved in naturalistic style of the Old Kingdom to a high degree of detail. Now, this is what I found on the internet. This is very interesting, this particular statue. I think this is a limestone type of granite statue here. The soldier, sorry, the shoulders here look very broad, don't you think? Very broad, a bit too broad. It looks unnatural. I don't know if the guy, guy was on um, steroids or some sort of growth hormones to make himself look brawn, pumped and terrific physically but it is unlikely back then it just the proportions the muscle proportions don't seem right the way this was sculptured I'll show you another one this is the seated men call it was supposed to be the top half of his body but unfortunately that fell off and there are hieroglyphics next to it 
I'm not sure if this is saying it's mean call. I don't know. The writing could depict someone else. It could talk about someone else's life story. I don't know. But I doubt it very much that these hieroglyphs is saying it's men call. Hmm. Show you another one. Very well crafted. Very, very well done. Very well sculptured. Incredibly accurate. Precise. Detail. Naturalistic, especially the face facial features here. I don't think it was us that carved these beautiful statues. I doubt it. I think it was done by somebody else who knew how to do this type of detailed artwork a thousand times before. I'd say it was done by what I call it, and I've explained this in previous videos, a laser stone cutting tool. A device, telescopic rod with a laser point, and what he may have done, or he or she or it has done, got a iPad, typed in measurements, details, how it's going to look, and then it was put in some sort of scanning machine, just one rock. I reckon it was done in one big slab of granite rock. And then the laser did the intricate part here, the really fine art detail right here. Very precise. I doubt it that you could use a stone chisel and hammer to really chisel it to perfection by hand. That would take forever. But to do it by laser, very time efficient, I'd say. Here's another one. See this? Very precise. These are his two wives, supposedly, and this is Minkor. Once again, nice broad shoulders, nice physique. These people looked very athletic, looking for its time, don't you think? Because I think back then, the Egyptians didn't look anything like this. I think they must have looked very skinny and their diet would have been pretty limited depending on, you know, counting in culture, hygiene and environmental factors. Here's another one. I'm not sure if this is Akhenakum or, or this is Benkor. I'm not sure. Very feminine looking, don't you think? Nice wide hips, curvy. And feminine, long feminine face too. If you look at the lips here, the eyes and the nose. Once again, this is really carved almost to perfection. Very, very naturalistic looking. Very real life looking. Very well done, may I say, for, I believe, the instrument they used back then but it wasn't done by us here's another one this um mystifies me a little bit here this particular bust this is supposed to be the young menko at its at his prime his features look incredibly youthful the ears are well positioned they look very feminine features he had. Nice, long, slender neck. But look at the shape of his head. It looks round and rather enlarged and elongated to the back. How strange. It is highly unlikely that even in the Old Kingdom, his skull will have developed as a teenager to to be shaped something like this. Highly implausible. Highly. But really feminine. Really incredibly youthful looking. Here's another one. This is supposed to be the Sphinx of Menkor. Okay. And this is made out of rose granite. Very, very robust stone. Especially to carve it so intric intricately, so perfectly. 
This is a map of the Valley of King Menkor. This is the interior of the pyramid. It's either it leads to the entrance of the pyramid or this was the villa outside the pyramid. But as you can see, this is detailing rooms, niches, a chamber, and apparently there were there was stuff inside. Not sure what, but there was stuff inside. Now I'm not sure if this map is true to scale or is accurate, but this is what I found online. Here's something interesting. This is one of the channels or passages that leads to the lower part of the pyramid here. This is Menkor and the, his queen, his wife, buried underneath this particular passage. This was recently dug up and this is what they found. I'm not sure why this particular statue is placed in this particular upright position, but I've also noticed that a lot of the soil debris just glued this statue smack bang against this muddy brick wall. I don't know why it was placed like this, maybe purposely, I don't know, but I find it very odd that they found it in this position. Very odd. Assuming Menkor's successor, Sheps Seka, finished the rest of the pyramid, I don't know, was he a very articulate and, you know, well diligent, defined construction builder, project manager, property developer for his time, it is highly unlikely. There is a two stel from the 6th dynasty indicate the cult of the king was managed for two centuries after his death. And I'll show you the stel right here. This is supposed to be the stel and that's, that is seated beneath the feet of the statue that I showed earlier of his two wives. I'm not sure what it's indicating. I can't read hieroglyphs. If anyone does, please let me know. It's called the Menkor Triad. I'm not sure what it means here, but that's what they found. South of the pyramid are three smaller pyramids called the Queen's Pyramids. I'll show you in the next photograph here, as you can see. I'll show you a better view. That's from one side. Show you a better view. That's the other side right here. I know this. the third one is crumbled back behind me, but you can see these two small pyramids here that are adjacent to this one. They are, they are partly made from granite and limestone. The other two are inner core construction was never completed. The center one, I think he's talking about um, talking about that one the center one contained bones of a young woman question mark she was probably a squatter that was looking for a place to sleep that night or just wanted to camp out and called it home I don't know that's just my analogy there east of that pyramid was a mortuary temple built from massive limestone blocks weighing up to 200 tons each were there squatters living in these little master bus pyramids. Hmm. Did that indicate that there was bad economic times? Was there massive homelessness crisis? Was there massive unemployment? So why would someone go in and say, oh, I found bones of a young woman. This might indicate she was queen. What if she, what if she was just a homeless woman? What if she just needed a place to stay for a few nights to shelter herself from the a very turbulent economic upheaval, right? There could have been massive unemployment. There could have been a civil war. You don't know. You don't know what the woman's history is. All I'm saying is that if they said that that's what they found in one of them and they think that she must have been some sort of, had some sort of royalty status, I doubt it. I think they may have been placed there to cover up 
whatever went wrong in her life before she died. I don't know. It's all a mystery to me at the moment. This is the other end, the other side facing out of the of this gateway right here. Have a look at these stone blocks right here. Heavy, big, and very well cut and very well placed. Interesting, don't you think? And look at this little plaza right here. Paved. It must have been a very smooth plaza. Very smooth, very paved and smooth floor back then. Very, very interesting, I find. Here's, I'll show you a map. Once again, this is the map, the exterior map showing the interior. So this is the causeway, this is the pyramid, this is the other side of the pyramid, this is, would have been the villa, this would have been some sort of lake or some sort of pool that was situated near the pyramid. Ah, now that is a little giveaway there, don't you think? Hmm, I'm going to investigate that in another video. And other little niche chambers here and there's other looks like there's other possibly villas or buildings just adjacent to there so i'll let you have a look in your own time you can do your own research there inside these pyramids were found four statues smaller than life size of men called by goddesses 42 statues were found originally that represent Egyptian gnomes. Also found were him and his queen. I'll pronounce this well. I'll do my best. Um, Camerenepity. It's now in the Boston Museum. I'll show you what I mean. What I find interesting about this head bust is this is the aging mean call he looks stressed he looks like he's under a lot of pressure and he's not enjoying doing what he was doing at the time being top dog if you look at his features he's got bags under his eyes i don't think he slept very well during his time he looks like he's upset grumpy a lot of tension flaring up you can tell by the ridges here on his forehead. You could see that uh, his skin is not as youthful as he used to look. And, uh, and you can see that he's got crow's feet on the sides of his eyes. So for some reason, and you, if you look at, I'll get into that in a minute, the um, head shape. But for some reason, he wasn't enjoying what he was doing back then. Something went wrong, economically speaking. And the people were probably revolting against him. Whatever he did wrong, the people weren't happy with him. And if you look at his head shape, that's a normal shaped head. Normal shaped human head. Very precise. The way this was sculptured, his face, even the ears are very well placed, naturally placed on its sides. Even the eyes and the nose and the mouth very very natural realistic features here show him another one that's interesting this is his wife who is the head of her reign and that's Menkor next to her it's like she's top dog now she's taken over his reigns interesting and that's probably either their daughter or a concubine whoever it may be but it's interesting to see she started started taking charge of his position very interesting it may have happened while he was in his mid-20s or possibly when he was around 30 and she decided okay well I might as well just take over and be a head honcho for a while let me make the choices. Let me make the, the decisions around here. Because obviously she must have thought that he wasn't very confident. He was probably incompetent in his choices. And he was probably quite complacent as well in making quick decisions. So it's interesting that this particular sculpture is showing that she's head. Not just of the household, but of the reign 
of the country. That's very interesting. I'll show you another one. This is supposed to be the younger version of Menkor. And as you can see, if you look at the shape of the head, it looks normal, normal size. And I showed you the earlier bust when he was in his prime, when he was in his youth, his, the shape of his head was elongated and wide at the back. Was that really Menkor? Hmm. Show you another one. This is the side view of the same one. And as you can see, it looks like a normally shaped head, but for some reason, it looks a bit elongated. Okay, it looks a little bit larger than a normal, normal human shaped head. Very interesting. And even the beard, the way that's been shaped, that's been carved. Why is it that they left this in the first place? I don't know. It's unusually carved to this one, but it looks very precise, the features, the human features. I doubt it, it was us or a human um, artist that actually did this so precisely just by using primitive stone, stone cutting tools. I think it was done with a laser. Once again, with an iPad, put it in a scanning laser device and the laser just precisely cut it in one go, one go on a single block. That's how I that's how I think it was done. Also found is one boat pit in the Menkor Pyramid, discovered in 1998, a large statue of Ramses II um, snugged between Menkor and Queen's Pyramids were found. Probably was left abandoned at the time, question mark. Why would they do that? What I find interesting is a 12th century AD scholar by the name of Ad Al Latif was in town and made a record of what he witnessed. He said there were a lot of unknown writing of some sort on the face of the pyramids. Interesting. Furthermore, the facing stones were mostly intact, but some were quarried for stone for the city walls. Question mark. There was also graffiti of some sort left by earlier visitors to the pyramids. Whereabouts? He said the Sphinx nose was intact during his day. Wow. Very interesting account there, don't you think? This is what the Menkor Pyramid would have looked like in the past. This is just a um, computer digital illustration of what it would have looked like back then. Okay, so pretty impressive, I reckon, back then. Very, very impressive the way it was constructed, crafted, and put together. Really well done, may I say. Now, I'm going to give you a little interesting story here. And you can do your own research if you want to believe this or not. I'm not sure if this is a accurate account, but I'll get into it. I call this attempted demo day. One attempt in um, 1196 AD by Al Aziz Atman, Saladin's son and the Sultan of Egypt, tried to wreck it. Workmen tried their hand at demo day for eight months but found it too hard and way too expensive. The only remo they only removed one to two stones per day. You can, yeah, I can understand why, because they were damn heavy. They used primitive tools such as wooden wedges, levers to move the stones and ropes to pull them down. If a stone fell and not injured anybody, God forbid, it'll fall buried in the sand. Hmm, yeah, talk about, yeah, touch wood there. Wedges were used to split the stones into several pieces, then cart it away, probably using wooden sleds or wooden carts, you know, whipping the horses to the front of the encampment where it was left. I have to say this, but it was a shoddy job the way they did it. No matter how hard they tried to demolish it, they were exhausted and burnt out and left a long, large vertical gash at the northern face. Now I'll show you what I mean here. This is what I'm talking about there. I find this too good to be true that those workmen, as skinny as they were, non-athletic as they were, on a pr pretty primitive diet back then, 
could actually manage to hoist lever and throw, just throw these really heavy limestone blocks in this area. I don't buy it at all. This is a black and white photo. I think this was taken in the late 19th century of the bottom outer edge of Minkor Pyramid. And as you can see, once again, accurate stone blocks, accurately cut. And look how neatly placed they are side by side. Interesting. Show you another photo. This is what I mean. The long gash, the famous long gash. If you look at it very carefully here, this gash has a groove, a curvy groove here. It doesn't look straight, doesn't look perfectly vertical, especially here. How could the men back then, using their bare hands to lift 20, 50, 100 ton each of these limestone blocks with ropes, with wooden sleds, and just hoist them all the way down here, or just let one of them drop. If that were the case, gee, they really did a shoddy job, let me tell you. They weren't exactly well-traded, well-skilled construction builders, were they, for its time. Obviously, they just didn't know what they were doing. Is it possible, supposedly, that the gash was done by our Aziz men? Is there anything in writing that depicts that story? Is it possible that the demolition part was just a cover for treasure hunting? That he created a jewelry heist whilst under the guise of demolishing the pyramid? Hmm. Was the gash a sloppy workman job or was there another purpose to it? Interesting. The story goes by some recent eyewitness account and they had to pay guides, bribes to actually enter the inside this gash here. There's a tunnel, a very long tunnel that stretches out for several meters and then it just drops down to go to either the top center of the bottom chamber or near another passage that gets to the bottom middle chamber. Very interesting. There's a tunnel right in there. So a lot of questions that need to be answered. Why would George Weiss, an amateur explorer and full-time dodgy politician, would go through a lot of trouble to please the British? Why would he suggest it was a tomb of some sort with buried human bones? Were these bones purposely put there as a publicity stunt? A propaganda piece to make it seem it was used as such when it was unlikely? Hmm. And King Menko, why would a king, and this is very interesting, this baffles me to this day, and I think it would, you would question this, okay, his mind, just question his mind for a moment. Why would a king go through his entire life obsessing over a tomb burial construction, even though he wasn't ready to die yet? Why would he go through all that trouble to get ready to die? Why would, why would he think such a thing, especially during his prime? Was he miserably unhappy living a silver spooned, bodacious lifestyle whilst he was alive? Was he feeling tragically empty whilst he reigned during his prime? Did he feel troubled, confused, cut off? under tremendous stress or emotionally corrupted, burdened by his entourage of helpers that he turned to, that he turned to death as a means of finding eternal happiness? It just doesn't make sense. I'll show you something else. Is this talking about Menkor's wife, his reign and his concubine? Is this really saying that this is about Menkor? Seriously, is it? Does it really say that? Or is it talking about something else? A set of instructions, a eulogy, an epistle? I'm not sure. It could be anything. I don't know. But this is what they say. This is what conventional wisdom says. And I hate to tell you this, I just don't buy it. This is what I mean. 
that must be his son. This is Menkor, and that's his wife. For some reason, I get his wife had the brains, and he just had the brawn. Put on the show, a theatre performance, right? To please the masses, for some strange reason. Is this really depicting them? Is it? Is this is really his son? Interesting. Why these symbols? Are these symbols spelling their names? Telling them who they are? Or are they depicting somebody else entirely? And why were these statues carved so accurately? What sort of tools or instruments they used to carve it with such incredible detail, so lifelike? From my point of view, I've seen no writing within the chamber walls indicating anything other than a burial monument. Those pyramids were unlikely designed and constructed for that one sole purpose, including the Queen's Pyramids. Those pyramids, all three, were designed, constructed with absolute precision and time efficiency by someone else in some galaxy far, far away. The biggest and most obvious clue lie with the pyramids facing directly to the belt of Orion hovering above each apex. Could this indicate their point of contact? Dialing home like a stargate, perhaps? Could these pyramids be telling me and you something far more significantly substantial than what we've been told under the flag of human history education? Hmm. These conventional wisdom archaeologists, historians, and academics still use the runaway theory. It was us that built them. Yet they have not found the, pri the primary engineer or engineers, architect or architects, designer or designers, developer or developers mentioned on any hieroglyphics such as their name, address, phone number, a business name, a company account, or even where they actually came from. Not even a blueprint or any building plans. Nother. I can tell you right now, Neither one of these pyramids were built solely for the purpose of burying someone. I will never buy that, ever. These pyramids were built with the state-of-the-art mechanizations that are far-reaching. Us humans have barely scratched the surface to better understand the nature of these beings. Whoever they were, have an intelligence, stamina, and incredible competency that goes way beyond our wildest dreams. But I think the message is clear. They want us to remedy what's in here first, and then we'll be ready to dial up their number to make first contact. Hmm. Remember, these are the great mysteries that one day be revealed when humanity's minds are adequately ripe and balanced. Our time to voyage into the unknown will happen once we have developed a sense of adventure, making the impossible journey possible to bravely enter into a new world that no one else has ever gone before. In the next video, I'll be exploring a fascinating part of our Milky Way, the Belt of Orion and its connection to the Pyramids of Giza. That's all for now.